How many of you, by a show of hands, have heard a sermon series on the book of Judges? Three people? Okay, well, you have nothing to compare this to then. Uh, for the next six weeks, we're going to be in the book of Judges. I was going to share a highlight video of the book of Judges today, but in light of trying to cover three chapters today, I decided, ah, I can't show a seven-minute video. So, next week, maybe. But it's by the Bible Project. If you're interested in looking at that this week, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it online at thebibleproject.com. They do a great job of an overview of the book of Judges. It's a good supplement to what I'm going to dive into today. The book of Judges, if you've never read it, how many have, have read the book of Judges? It is a disturbing book. It is, as we will even see today, there is, it's a good book to teach to junior high boys. Because there's blood, and there's guts, and there's fighting, and there's evil. It's epic. But outside of those psychos, junior high boys, the rest of us typically find the book disturbing. And it is. It's disturbing on multiple levels. And the book of Judges happens right after the book of Joshua in your Old Testament. So if that helps you find the book, uh, you're welcome. Just start uh, at the beginning and find Judges. We'll be in chapter 1 and 2 and 3 today. It happens right after the book of Joshua. And Joshua recounts uh, the conquest, or at least the partial, the beginning, the beachhead conquest of the promised land. Joshua is the leader that follows Moses, and Moses led the people out of Egypt. Uh, they made a movie out about him, several movies, cartoon even. And Joshua leads this conquest, and then Judges tells this period immediately after. It gets its name from the leaders of Israel. They're called judges. Now, when you think of judges, you're probably thinking Supreme Court judge, and that is not at all what they mean. A judge, how it was used back then, is more like a tribal warrior leader. And these leaders were military leaders. And they were used by God. They were raised up by God to deliver the people of Israel from oppression. Now, the book of Judges, it begins with Joshua still alive. And Joshua is trying to get one of his daughters married. And he offers her hand in marriage to anybody who goes and beats up and kills all these bad people. And Othniel is the one who succeeds at this. And he is awarded... It'd be crazy if we could do this nowadays, right? He's awarded Joshua's daughter for his bravery. Now, it's interesting. Judges chapter 1 tells kind of the human perspective of what's going on in Israel. And then Judges chapter 2 gives us the divine God's perspective on what's going on. In Israel. And you're going to find that they agree on certain things, but they disagree on others. And it's important for us to study this book for a myriad of reasons. One is that there's this recurring theme, there's this recurring refrain in the book of Judges. It actually ends with this line it says, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And this is why this book is so important for us to read. It's not because there's people in this book that need to be considered role models. There are none. The closest one to a role model would be Othniel, but we know very little about him. Most of the judges are really flawed people. They are sinful people. 
Some of them are so far from even knowing the God of Israel that they are utter pagans. And yet God uses them. He raises them up in Israel. And so it's a very pertinent book, especially in a world that is multicultural and multireligious, a world that has all sorts of pressures in it and where people are doing what is right in their own eyes. It sounds a little like nothing's changed. And so we're going to jump into this book, and what I want to do is I want to kind of highlight the, the judges' cycle. There's this cycle in judges that happens again and again and again and again, and it's probably better to think of it as a spiral that's downward. And this spiral happens again and again and again, and you can just see the wheels coming off of the thing as this nation spirals out of control and into sin and evil. And the main sin, the issue in the Old Testament, I like how this scholar puts it, loyalty to Yahweh, that's God's name, refusing to worship any other God was, of course, at the heart of salvation in the Old Testament. At the heart of the Old Testament, how God sets up salvation is, are you loyal to me? So when David is called the man after God's own heart, it's not because he was without sin. It's not because, in fact, you would probably not call him as your pastor. He sexually assaulted a woman, Bathsheba. He had her husband murdered. It took a whole nine months before he repented of that. Like apparently he didn't feel bad prior to that. I mean, that's how, that's how sin had infected David's life, that for nine months he was unrepentant. He refused to address issues in his own home. He was married to 49 women. Uh, probably not a pastor material. But think of the pastor's wives, what they could have accomplished at church. Anyway. Since a lot of churches see it as a team effort, right? It's like, wow, that's a team. Uh, by the way, thank you for not seeing it as a team effort here at our church. Um, the grace that we are shown oftentimes. David, though, he was loyal to God always. He never worshipped another god. Solomon, his son worshiped other gods. His heart was divided. His loyalties were divided between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the Baals and the Asherah, the gods of the Canaanites. And that's the whole issue in the book of Judges. Are the people going to be loyal to Yahweh? Are they going to follow him? We're going to see that that's even what God says is the point of the book of Judges. Now it says this in verse 19. This is uh, chapter one of judges the lord whenever you see the lord in all capitals by the way uh, i've said this before but just a reminder whenever you see that word lord in all capitals uh, that is referring to what's called the tetragrammaton and that the tetragrammaton is the hebrew uh for the name of god okay and it's called the tetragrammaton because it's four consonants In the Hebrew Bible, there's no vowels. Uh, Later, scribes went in and they did this pointing system. (laughs) So it's really fun to read Hebrew. They did this pointing system uh, to try to help you understand where the vowels are and what the vowels would be. Uh, But the original Hebrew manuscripts, all they had was consonants. And God's name, whenever it's rendered into the English, because we don't want to offend Jewish people who to this day do not speak his name. In fact, we're not even sure how it's pronounced. So uh, some say Yahweh, some would say Yahweh. Uh, but whenever you see the Lord, that's the actual rendering of the proper name of God. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. 
This is the human report uh, telling us that they weren't able to drive out certain people from the hill country because they had better stuff than they did. They had a more powerful military. And then it says, as Moses has promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from it the three sons of Anak. And then 21, the Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. And what we're seeing is the human report is saying, we weren't strong enough to drive them out. They had chariots fitted with iron. They were too tough for us to drive them out. Now, this is interesting. We're going to, this is an aside. Do you want to learn something interesting about the Bible today? I don't want to protect you from your Bible. This is where it gets really weird and interesting. But we're going to chase down the sons of Anak because you read sons of Anak and you're like, I don't know what that's about. Well, we're going to look at that briefly. Numbers 13.33, we encounter the sons of Anak. This is when the spies go into the promised land and they come back, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, report and say, we can take them. The 10 say this. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. The sons of Anak, these descendants are tall people. Now, when you think about tall people in the Bible, you think about who? Goliath. Now, Goliath was probably roughly 8 to 10 feet tall. Um, I'm on the 8 to 8 foot side. Uh, I'm, no, I'm not personally 8 foot tall, but I, I believe that he was closer to probably 8 to 9 foot tall. Now, it's interesting, when you have these descriptions of Goliath, not only is he tall, he's not like a thin, skinny rail of a man who's tall. He's put together. Like, think The Rock, right? Like, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, the wrestler guy. Uh, he, think Andre the Giant, the, the wrestler guy. Think these really tall, huge people, but built. And the way we know he's built is because it gives a description of his armor and how heavy it was. It gives a description uh, of his weapon and how big it was. And clearly, this man was somebody to contend with. And so when you read about giants in the promised land, don't think like Jack and the Beanstalk giants. Don't think 15, 20 foot tall. There's no archaeological evidence for that. But think more like 8, 9, 10 foot tall. If I were to face somebody who is seven and a half, eight foot tall, in fact, I remember one of my first early memories of going to a Nuggets game was uh, when the Denver Nuggets were playing the Portland Trailblazers. And we had courtside seats. We were underneath the hoop on one of the sides. And Portland had a player. His name was Kevin Duckworth. He was huge. He was a giant of a person. And if somebody said, hey, why don't you punch that guy? I wouldn't be able to reach his face. I would have had to, you know, punch him, and it had been like, you know, punching, like, I don't know, his thigh. I mean, just, he was huge. He was a giant of a man. And to picture myself fighting him is stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you pick a fight with that guy? You can see why these spies came back and they report. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. They're huge. These are big people. Now, why are they so big? Well, the text tells us. We saw the Nephilim. This this word Nephilim is actually the Hebrew word, root of the word giant. And where do they come from? Well, we encounter the giants in the Bible's weirdest passage ever, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also after when the, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. And this is right before the flood. See, 
One of the problems in the Canaan, in the promised land, is that God still is trying to get rid of this issue, the Nephilim, this, this twisting of his creation. All right, that was for fun. Wasn't that interesting? Some of you are like, well, that's weird. Some of you are like, go on. All right. Now, it's interesting if we continue back in Judges chapter 1, but Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Ta'anak or Dor or Iblaim or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. Now, we're getting back to the human report of why we can't drag, drive them out. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. The, it got so bad that the Amorites, which are a people group in Canaan that the Israel was supposed to drive out, the Ammonites confined the Danites. Dan is a tribe of Israel. Ammonites confined the tribe of Dan to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. Like, Amorites are so mean and nasty and courageous. In fact, listen to this. Well, that's jumping ahead of myself. But the text seems to say that they were so fierce, fiercely determined to stave off Dan and the Israelites. And as we read chapter 1, it's easy for us to kind of go, yeah, that would be hard. I mean, how do you fight giants? People who are eight, nine, ten foot tall. How do you beat an army that has better stuff than you? How, of course. I mean, clearly these people were determined to stay in the land. Right? That's what the Bible says. And it's easy for us to buy this dog ate my homework excuse. Now, why is it easy? Because we're human. And we come to God with our dog ate my homework excuses quite regularly. You know, I'd really like for you to go talk to that person after church. Ah, but, you know, they left too fast. You know, I'd really like for you to volunteer to help with that. Ah, but I got that thing on Saturday. You know, I'd really like for you to, I mean, we regularly give excuses to God because we do not want to be infringed upon. We don't want to do things that are hard. We want comfort. And thank God he hasn't asked us to pick up swords and go fight people. Because we'd probably, before we look down our noses too much at Israel and go, yeah, those dorks, I mean, why didn't they? They're so wimpy. Is there any fear ever in church? Is there ever any fear in Christians? Is there ever any, it, does fear ever motivate anything that we do? You know, being a pastor, I get all sorts of interesting things that cross my desk Please for money, please for energy, please for time, please for, you know, help us. And so many of them are politically minded today. And so many of those pleas start with, ah! if nobody, if nobody stands with up, if nobody gives, if nobody helps, if nobody. Ah! And it's just fear. It's scared. And God expects his people to be brave, to be courageous. In fact, that's what it said in Joshua. Be bold and courageous, for the battle belongs to the Lord. Well, let's get Yahweh's perspective on this. Chapter 2. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, now, this is interesting. This is a free aside. Whenever you read places in the Old Testament, it's easy to go, I don't know where that is, and I don't care, and let's move on. Let's get to the point. Gilgal is down by Jericho. This is by where Israel entered into the promised land. This is where they were trusting God for the deliverance of 
the land of Canaan to the people. And it's interesting because here we have this description of the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? Well, this is a character that we've seen several times throughout the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord is who spoke to Moses at the burning bush incident. The angel of the Lord uh, continues to show up. And here we're going to see the angel of the Lord several times in the book of Judges. Most scholars agree that the angel of the Lord are Christophanes. They are Old Testament appearances of Christ. This is Jesus. This is Jesus appearing to the people at Bochim. He travels from Gilgal to Bochim. Now, the ancient Jewish people, they had this view that there were two powers in heaven. And so the whole notion of the Trinity coming from the Hebrew people is not actually that surprising. Uh, er, scholarship today is demonstrating that Jews believe that there were two powers in heaven. There was God, Yahweh, the God, the Father, who nobody could see, and he was in heaven. And then there was this, the angel of the, notice it's all caps there, angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh. And it's interesting because when people interact with this angel, it's clearly not just an angel. This is a divine being who's God. For instance, what led the people out of Egypt was the angel of the Lord. And there are accounts of people, we see this in Jude actually, that Jude says that Jesus led the people out of Egypt. He was the angel of the Lord. He is the angel of the Lord. There are people who bow down and worship him. There are people who interact with this angel of the Lord like it's God because it is God. This is God in the flesh, Old Testament, okay? He's been with the people this whole time. He's been with the people since they left Egypt I brought you, in fact, here it says it in the text we're looking at. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. Do you take that as a figurative thing or do you take that as a literal thing? It's interesting how Christians often go, let's read the Bible literally. But when it literally says, I brought you up out of Egypt, I led you, we want to make that figurative. Well, he figuratively did that. Or did he literally do that? I would argue Jesus literally hung out with these idiots for 40 years in the desert. Jesus literally led them into battle in the promised land. <gasps> what? Well, I'm just reading it literally. I said... I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. That's what he told them to do. Yet you have disobeyed me. Yeah, but they've got chariots with iron, and they really don't want to leave. It's hard. That's what chapter 1 told us. It's hard. Following God is so hard. I don't think God cares about our feelings in chapter 2. Right? Yet you have disobeyed me. Jesus in the flesh, standing with the tribe of Israel, you've disobeyed me. And then this is a great follow-up. Moms, dads, write this down. Why have you done this? It's a good follow-up. Great follow-up question. Kind of puts the whole impetus on the child. <gasps> And chapter 1, by the way, gives us the why they have done this. It's hard. They have iron chariots. They didn't want to leave. We asked nicely and everything. <laughs> and I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. <laughs> so now he decides, I'm not going to help you. They will become traps for you and their gods will become snares to you. It's like Jesus is saying, all right, this is going to be fun. Your whole land is going to be booby-trapped with landmines. These people that you have disobeyed, 
me on and you didn't drive them out, you didn't break down their altars, you did not tell, do what I told you to do, they're going to be landmines throughout the, the land for you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud. And they called that place Bochim. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. That's how you know this is God. They sacrificed to the angel of the Lord. They wept. That's why it's called Bochim, because in Hebrew that sounds like wept. At this point in Israel's history, the angel of the Lord departs. He leaves. And right after this, uh, the macho honchos amongst Israel decide, well, let's go do this now. Like all the frat boys decide, it's time. We should have listened in the first place. He just left, so let's do this. Let's make this happen ourselves. And so they do, and they get killed and creamed and destroyed. Sometimes we do the same thing. Sometimes we disobey. We know what we should do. It's clear to us. God then says, hey, you messed it up. You disobeyed. And then we're like, oh, I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to get it right this time. And then it fails miserably. We even do what God said we should have done in the first place. And we fail miserably. And we're like, how come it's not working out? He told me, I thought. There's a timing thing with God. You don't have all day. You don't have all life. You can miss things. We can miss opportunities that God has placed in front of us because of fear or disobedience or incompetence or a myriad of things. So we're going to skip ahead. Chapter 2, verse 10. So after that whole generation, this is uh, Joshua and that gang, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, uh, they died. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. That's one of the saddest lines in the Bible. I have wept over the reality of this line in today's world. I don't know whether to... No, I do. I should curse Facebook and social media, but I keep going back to it like a dog goes back to its vomit for some reason. It's in the Bible. I just... It's in the Bible. You go back to it, and I'm amazed at the amount of people that I grew up with in church. And we went to a fantastic church We went to a church that wasn't fundamentalist and crazy and had all these rules and do's and don'ts. We went to this church that had scholars, Dr. Jim Dixon, Dr. Bob Belts. They taught us. We had people who understood the scriptures and loved us well. And I'm amazed at how many of those people have fallen away. They get to their 40s. And life happens and the, the, the seashore, just the pressures, the pleasures of this world just have eroded it. And being an Orthodox Christian in today's world is, is not terribly popular. We've lost home field advantage. It's not really the worldview of the vast majority of the people in the world. There's a podcast called Exvangelical. It's for people who have left the church and they get together and they make a podcast and talk about how evil and backwards and stupid we all are because we study the book of Judges. There's another podcast called Your Atheist Pastor, and he was training to be a pastor and he lost his faith in seminary and now his mission as a pastor is to be pastor to atheists and help them to come out of the closet and be okay with that and to discuss how they left the church there's another podcast called heathen podcast and it's a place where people who grew up in the evangelical and fundamentalist and pentecostal churches all congregate and by the way if you've never heard what a podcast is it's not your generation that's doing this These are millennials. 
These are people my age and younger who go, I am sick of the church. I don't understand it. It is backwards. It, the book is an Iron Age ancient book. Why study it? Why listen to this? These people are on the wrong side of history. And yada, yada, yada. And they're creating community online. A generation grew up who neither knew the Lord It's interesting. Who gets the blame for this one? The Bible doesn't ass- assign blame on this, but in a backhanded way it kind of does because God gave rules. He gave instructions in Deuteronomy on how to raise your kids. He, he said, talk about what God has done for Israel in your life as you walk around and as you eat at dinner and as you go about your daily life, talk with your kids. And there has to be a personal testimony element to that. I would submit to you that people who are my age and younger just never heard their parents or grandparents say, God is good and has done this for me. We always were in church, but it didn't seem personal. It didn't seem like, it's like, why are we here? I heard the story of a young woman when she was eight years old in the, growing up in the Lutheran church had resolved at eight that she wasn't going to be a Lutheran any longer, that she was not going to go to church anymore. Eight. And the answer isn't Sunday school. The answer isn't lift. The answer isn't programs. The scriptures say, parents, Talk to your children. Testify to them. Witness to them about the goodness of God in your lives. I'm afraid that we're living out this line again. A generation has grown up who does not know the Lord nor what He has done. Now we get the beginning of the cycle Judges chapter 2, verse 11. You're going to see the cycle play out time and time again in the book of Judges. And it always starts with this line. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals or the Baals. You see, the evil they did was idolatry. They served other gods. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them up out of Egypt They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Ashtoreths. Ashtoreth is a fertility goddess in Canaan. And they would use a phallic symbol, an Ashtoreth pole on high places as a place of worship to this goddess. And their, their worship was vulgar. It's disgusting. It's probably gained great applause in our day. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them and they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but, and listen to this word, prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. You ever wondered why Jesus hung out and ministered to prostitutes? Because from God's perspective, that's the whole lot of us. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. And whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, The people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. 
following other gods, serving and worshiping them. They refuse to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. This is a tragic story. So that's the introduction to the book of Judges, Judges 1 and 2. And that gives us right there, those verses I just read, the last part of chapter 2, gives you the Judges cycle, and you're going to see this play out a time and time and time again. So chapter 3, here we go. Well, this is chapter 2 still. It says this, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. Sometimes you wonder, why are these bad people kept here? Why does God allow all these terrible people to stay amongst us, to run the governments, to run the organizations, to run... It could be a test. It could be a test to see if you will remain faithful. It could be that he wants to test you. How hard is it to be allegiant to somebody if everybody's allegiant? How hard is it to be just part of the crowd? And that's what American Christianity has been for decades, for centuries. It has been everybody's a Christian because they're American. tide's turning it's going to come with a cost to follow christ to follow god to be to be allegiant to him to be a loyal, obediently loyal to god is now more and more and more and more against the cultural grain that's how it's always been We just happen to live in this era of the civil religion where people thought they were one thing, but they really weren't. So chapter 3, verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. You know, You might think, well, I don't serve Baal or Asherah, so I'm cool. I'm good. We have other gods. We have other idols. We have the God of mammon, the God of money, the God of career, the God of success. We have the God of family. We have the God of acceptance, wanting people to like us and accept us. We have the God of security, safety, protection, comfort. We have all these gods, and most of the time we have, we don't just completely and utterly say, okay, God. Yahweh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, I'm not with you anymore. I'm with these gods. What we do is we do a thing called syncretism. We do this thing where we have this idle mindset, as Tim Keller puts it. We have an idle mindset, and we have this, we have this bartering relationship with the God of the Bible. We have this relationship with him where we think there's this formula that if I do X, then he does Y. That if I do these things, he does this for me. Gang, that's an idol. That's what worship of Baal and Asherah was. If we do these things, then Asherah will make sure that none of our livestock die. If we do these things, then Asherah will make sure that our children don't die. If we do these things, then Baal will make sure that we aren't invaded and destroyed. If we do these things, the gods will take care of us. The gods will protect us. The gods will care for us. The gods will rescue us. The gods will save us. What God are you? We have gods and institutions. We have gods 
all over the place. This is a problem in our day and age. Idolatry is rampant. Are we doing evil in God's eyes? Because we are grabbing hold of things that aren't Him. We are looking for our salvation, our Savior, our rescue in things that aren't God. And sometimes we dress it up. Like I said, we don't just totally chuck God to the side, but we think that His job is to take care of why for us. And all along He says, I gave you a job. You've been disobedient to me. (laughs) But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Where's this from? 2 Peter. 2 Peter gives this long list of uh, traits that Christians should exhibit right before this. And he talks about how one of our core problems is the reason we don't exhibit these traits, the reasons that we don't look this way is that we have forgotten. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. You see, the the key to unlocking this thing is not trying harder to be a good Christian. The key to, to be a good person is remembering that your sins are forgiven in the person of Christ. And then Peter goes on in verse 12 and he says, so I will always remind you, even though you know them and are already firmly established in the truth you now have. You see, the judges, the Israel forgot. And that's our same problem. We forget who the true savior of the world is. We forget who the rescuer is. We forget who God is. And we fashion gods after our own liking and after what we want and what we enjoy and what makes us comfortable. Back to Judges chapter 3. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Kishan Reshathaim, or whatever, king of Aram, to whom the Israelites were subject eight years. Where were you at eight years ago? Sam was 12, a punk child at that point in his life. Not just a punk 20-year-old like he is today. Eight years is a long time, is it not? And these folks were subject to a Canaanite group of people for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. And the Lord gave Cushan Rashtayim, the king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. This is the cycle, and Othniel is the first judge. And then it ends with this. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. And that's the problem. These judges keep dying. Every single one of these judges after they rescue Israel. And by the way, out of all the judges we're going to look at for the next few weeks, we're going to look at Gideon, we're going to look at Samson, we're going to look at Jephthah. All these judges, Othniel's the best one. He's the, he's the most righteous. There's nothing bad said about him. All the others have major, major flaws. <laughs> but you know what Othniel's flaw was? He died. But there is a judge that's coming. There's a judge who came. And this judge died, but he rose again. Revelations chapter 1, verse 18. We need this type of judge. We need a judge, a Savior who comes to the world, and he does not die, and there is no end to the peace that's given to the land. And Jesus says, I am living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of Hades. You see, there's a judge who will not die 
Actually, he did die, and it was through his death that defeat, what looked like his defeat, brought about the defeat of the gods. There's a second judge. We're not going to look at him today. I'm going to have to push that off. I planned way too much today. I was ambitious. I think there's a couple questions for us to ponder and to wrestle, though, as we close up our time today. Are you in an idol worshiping mode with God? Are you in a bartering kind of relationship with God? I know often I am. I know oftentimes I get stuck and I think, you know, I'm a good guy. I, I'm, a, I'm a nice person. I've, I've tried to do these things. I've tried to do that. I think I'm following you. And boy, it sure feels like you might owe me something. And it's only human nature to feel this way. It's only natural. It seems to be how the world works. But then we get reports from people much further down the road than us. Reports from folks like Mother Teresa who lived her entire life ministering in the slums of India amongst the most poor of the poor. And at the end of her life, she reports, I never really felt God's presence. Never really sensed that, that he was there and you know what i i appreciated her for saying that i i i gravitated to her because she said that because she was honest it would have really frustrated me if she had said and every single day every single moment looking at these poor people looking at the evil in the world i always felt god's presence because i would have been like you are nuts What planet are you on? Because what I look around and what I see is, where are you? Where are you? And I want to create this idol worship relationship with him. I'm doing these things, therefore you got to do this. And gang, I've known way too many people to know that it doesn't work that way. I know way too many tragedies that have happened to people who are so godly, so love Jesus. And I realize this X equals Y relationship that I want to have with God, relationship he wants with me. So are you in an idol worshiping relationship with God? Second, are you willing and able to follow God no matter what the cost, no matter what he asks of you? He wants to be Lord of everything in your life, not just a handful of stuff, not just for an hour on Sundays, a few moments here and there when you open and crack open your Bible. He wants to be Lord of your life. He wants your allegiance. He wants your obedience. And how could he ask so much of us? Because he gave us so much. He gave us Jesus Christ, his only son, who lived the perfect life, a life that you and I are unable to live. And he died a death that you and I deserve to die. And through his death on the cross, he made it so we can have access to the Father, so we can have relationship with him. The, to the veil was torn in the temple. We have access to the Holy of Holies. As Hebrew says, come with boldness to the throne. And he is now our father. We are adopted. There's no condemnation. We are now free. I mean, if you just gather up Romans chapter 8, how could you want an idle relationship with this God? who's done so much for us. All right, well, I got a way too vulgar of a story to tell right before a potluck. So I'll have to wait.
So let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me. Thank you that you use flawed people. And I pray that you would speak to each of us in our idol-making hearts. Help us to take these words that you confront us with and to be allegiant to you and to follow you, to be obedient to you, no matter what it costs. Holy Spirit, make it so. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And may he bless the food of the potluck. Amen.